for instance, you know, <laughs> and quite a few others. Boris Yeltsin, who wanted at some point uh, after the unsuccessful coup in 1991 by the KGB, uh, Yeltsin uh, just considered my, 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 me, I mean, as a chief of the uh, Russian security service, well, called now FSB. And uh, this was discussed with Galina Starovoitova, a uh, Russian liberal dissident, wonderful woman. She was shot by the terrorists in, in Moscow, I mean, in, in, I'm sorry, in St. Petersburg. And she said, uh, well, Mr. Hamid Yeltsin, uh, Oleg would be a very good chief of KGB. And Yeltsin said, I agree, but there is one problem. If we make him the chief of the KGB, we will split the organization. Because half of the guys, his former friends, colleagues, subordinates, they uh, hate him. Well, the other half of me, so they like him. So as a result, the well, the KGB will simply fall apart. So we cannot do that. Let him do as a consultant. That's what I would become later. And I offer the plan how to dismember the old KGB and turn into a, well, actually the United States served uh, as a kind of a, uh, an example, I mean, uh, several CIA, FBI, NSA, I mean, no concentration of security and intelligence in one, under one rule. And that's very important for democratic process. And that's what was achieved at the time. Well, so those were the days, my friend. We thought they never end. <laughs> well, so with, with, in your older, in your later years uh, in the organization, was, was Putin at, at that time becoming a young KGB officer? Well, Putin actually uh, became a, uh, uh, a KGB officer at an early age when after graduation from uh, Leningrad University. But, and uh, when he joined the KGB, uh, he was sent to East Germany, and actually, and spent there five or six years. And that's it. Well, that was East Germany. It was a, sort of a part of the Soviet bloc countries. But he learned something. He well knew German well. He started English. Uh, but w once his um, um, tour of duty in Germany was over, he came back to Leningrad, St. Petersburg. And there was no job for him. I mean, he was unemployed for a while. And he brought a car, a German, you know, East German car, and he worked as a driver briefly. I mean, ta taxi driver, you know. <laughs> And then uh, uh, the Russian uh, reforms began at the time, and the mayor of St. Petersburg was Anatoly Sokchak, a very prominent individual, intellectual type, uh, you know. Uh, he was at some time uh, uh, the chief of the law school of Leningrad University, and Putin was one of his students. So Sobchak and I were on very good personal terms, and one day he asked me, Ole, could you name anyone from the KGB now that I'm the mayor? I need some uh, unofficial contact with the organization. I named a couple of guys. He said, oh, too highly placed. I need someone who is you know, you know, just small fish, but uh, who knows how to do things. I could not name anyone. And then uh, he may have, uh, well, anyway, he just remembered about his old students, I mean, uh, by uh, name uh, uh, Putin, uh, a law school. And he invited him, and Putin became, after East Germany, uh, an assistant to Sobchak, the mayor of St. Petersburg, on matters of uh, international relations, so-called. What he did, Putin, at that time, and that what made him known in Moscow, uh, Russia was in trouble in terms of food supplies. There were really lines uh, huge lines uh, standing you know, to buy bread and sausage, you know, I mean, uh, food crisis. And uh, <clears throat> Putin uh, managed, well, thanks to his smart and business approach, uh, so just starting sales of Russian oil products and natural gas through Finland, which is next door from St. Petersburg, for, in exchange for food. And Leningrad, well, overcame the food, I mean, problem. And Yeltsin at some point said, how come there is no food or anything in Moscow and elsewhere, but in Leningrad they have everything. 
And he was told, well, there is a guy, he is a mayor's assistant, very enterprising. Who is he? Let him come to Moscow. That's how Putin came to Moscow and joined the business administration of the Kremlin. And in that capacity became sort of better known as a figure of, you know, business guy. But uh, later, uh, just in two words, because that's a long story, uh, well, Putin's, I mean, uh, Yeltsin's daughter was married to a prosecutor, senior prosecutor in Moscow. And he was cheating on her, Yeltsin's daughter. And Yeltsin was furious, but he could not do anything with prosecutor. You know, he was not a man who would use pol pol polonium or anything. He was a different man. <laughs> well, so how does, how does he... And, and uh, so uh, he asked, he, well, Putin offered a solution. Uh, that prosecutor was invited, he was a kind of a lady, you know, chasing young ladies. He was invited to a KGB rented apartment in, uh, in uh, St. Petersburg. And um, there were two young ladies, you know, hired by the KGB. And uh, it was, they you know, undressed and had fun, three of them. And it was all shown live on Russian television. That's what the really? Putin arranged. And of course, the Russian public was shocked. <laughs> the prosecutor general with naked girls, you know. So they, they demanded immediately the Russian parliament, uh, I mean, his resignation. And he, well, resigned. And this is when Yeltsin said about Putin, that guy, he knows how to handle problems. <laughs> and from that moment on, uh, he would go up and up. And, uh, well, many years later, when Yeltsin was in retirement, he was interviewed, and you will not find this interview anymore. It was deleted from all, I mean, uh, media and uh, internet, but I have a clipping from a Russian uh, weekly at that time. Uh, well, uh, three times, so just, uh, I say, three years after his retirement, he was asked, well, Mr. President, as you look back at your career, what major errors of judgment did you make? And he also said, oh, I had so many, but could you name a couple? You know, and he said, okay. The war in Chechnya, number one, greatest mistake. I mean, the launching of the war in Chechnya. The choice of my successor. That's what he meant, Putin. These are Yeltsin's words. Well, but Putin managed to, thanks to his uh, enterprising nature, and uh, uh, managed to, well, uh, high <laughs> prices on oil and <laughs> raw materials, which Russia is rich of, to, well, improve the lives of the nation and to make it again a sort of a power which challenges, as it used to in the old Soviet days, to challenge the West. In that sense, many Russians like Putin for his enterprising nature, for his courage, you know, and, you know, capability to handle things even when they are difficult. So that's, that's briefly. <laughs> what, what, what's your opinion of him today? Of who? It hasn't changed. <clears throat> I would ask uh, uh, opinion. I said one thing which I mentioned. His wife of 30 years, she uh, divorced him. And that's a little strange. Uh, that um, a lady uh, who is the wife of the president would abandon him. Well, there were lots of speculations about uh, this, um, uh, I mean, event. Uh, uh, the, the Russian media named a couple of uh, Girl, I mean, ladies, uh, actresses who were allegedly involved with Putin. Uh, well, those ladies denied vehemently, but I mean, uh, there are other reasons for uh, the breakdown of their marriage. But so Putin is now fully married to the state affairs and the state security. <laughs> and he has restored the Russian Orthodox Church. The man who was a communist, I mean, by obviously, you could not be a, a member of the KGB or major organization without being a communist in the old days. But he restored also the Russian Orthodox Church, I mean, as part of the establishment. Well, they were always the Russian Orthodox, just part of the establishment, but they kept a low profile. Now, Putin, you know, he's just like a, a real Christian. He forgot about communist ideology, atheism. Now he's with Russian Orthodox Church and the guy, uh, Kirill by name, who I had, was friendly with, I, I mean, the uh, current chief of the Russian Orthodox Church. They appear at all public functions and, you know, they, 
they just behave uh, well. The uh, uh, Archbishop behaves as he should, but he, uh, you, uh, Putin, a former atheist <laughs> member of the party, also does everything. I mean, all the gestures, all the things as, a, as an old, I mean, be old believer in Christian values. So that's a, a kind of a transition or transformation. Transformation, right? And since Russians have. Uh, lost uh, ideological guidance with the, after the collapse of the USSR, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has been slowly moving back, uh, winning the hearts and minds of many people. Uh, and uh, Putin is just following the trend. He, he wants to be, you know, the Russian bureaucracy is as strong as it was before. But there is a, a difference. Uh, uh, in the old Soviet days, uh, the society or the system was built on three major pillars. Well, three major pillars. Well, Communist Party, uh, KGB, and a Russian uh, or Soviet military industrial complex. Well, the Soviet system is now over. What's Putin built his system on? On KGB, number one, no Communist Party. On Russian Orthodox Church, which has been completely under control and guidance of the KGB. And uh, on Russian business, but only that part, part of business which complies with the KGB uh, wishes. I mean, if they do something different, like uh, Khodorkovsky or Berezovsky or Gusinsky, they will be in trouble. So if they collaborate with the system, that's okay. So these are the three pillars of the current society. KGB, Russian Orthodox Church run by the KGB, and Russian business, which would, which would have to run, I mean, I mean and, and do what the KGB wants them to do. That's a, in a sense, we have a, not the ugliest uh, re I mean, uh, restoration of the Soviet system. And there are no, you know, thousands of millions of uh, dead, uh, imprisoned, no more. That's the law over. But like select, but some selected individuals will pay dearly if they raise their voice against the current Russian system. We have two new books that have come out in the United States about the deep state. It sounds as if you're saying there's no difference between the deep state of Russia and the deep state of the United States. Well, no. The United States has long traditions of uh, uh, democracy, and this is a. Um, I mean, most attractive country in the world for most of the people. Uh, Russia, in that sense, uh, uh, intellectuals, by the way, are leaving Russia. And not because they are politically uh, prosecuted, because they simply uh, feel more comfortable uh, that their knowledge will be shared with students who one day may become leaders of the Western world. In Russia, they do not feel comfortable, because if they say something, uh, which is not uh, pro-Putin, they may be in trouble. They will not be promoted. Uh, well, there may be some other things. Well, sometimes they even, you know, use po poison or whatever, if necessary, for those who talk too much. <laughs> so, uh, Putin has, has said that he's trying to um, basically restore Russia to its former greatness. I mean, uh, what does he mean by that? And, and if he succeeds, what, what would the world look like? Well, uh, Russia is great, well, anyway, it's a great nation, and it's uh, not Putin's or Stalin's uh, invention, uh, but Russia suffered so much, and uh, the former USSR doesn't exist anymore. Well, the split of the USSR uh, uh, was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, I quote Putin's words, you know. And he is right in a sense. So for him now is to keep Russia intact. I mean, well, no one really threatens Russia today. But Putin uh, did not, and that's not in his character, to be on the uh, position of defense, protection. He wants to show that Russia is powerful, that Russia can do anything, and Russia, you know, and what was happening in Syria where Russia stood uh, clearly on the uh, side of the current uh, Syrian regime and actually used uh, Russian air force to bomb, you know, bomb some of the sites uh, held by the rebels. So um, Putin, uh, in that sense, feel quite confident. 
And uh, the people of Russia generally support him because the economic situation in Russia is not that bad. And Putin has shown that he is a true Russian. He will never just go uh, to, you know, bed uh, totally drunk. Well, that happened to one of the previous Russian leaders, as you know. <laughs> and I remember I was in Moscow at the time when uh, the Bulgarian chief of uh, KGB, I mean security and intelligence, uh, called um, uh, Krychkov, the KGB chief of intelligence, and said that uh, Bulgarians want Russian help in, well, doing something to that traitor and bad man, Markov. So and in, in my presence, uh, Andropov, KGB chairman, Krychkov, uh, chief of the intelligence, Russian at the time, and I myself, chief of foreign counterintelligence director, we were sitting and discussing this problem, the request of the Bulgarian leadership. And Andropov, in my presence, said, I am against political assassinations. And Khrushchev, the chief of the intelligence service, oh, if we deny the Bulgarians our assistance, then, uh, you know, the Bulgarians may uh, just fire, fire, I mean, get rid of the intelligence chief uh, of Bulgaria, and he is a good friend of ours. And then uh, Andropov said, okay, give the Bulgarians all the necessary tools, but stay away from real, I mean, action, no action. Give them the tools. So the Russians provided polonium, Russians provided, I mean, the mechanism, how to use it. Well, the rest was done, as you know, and Markov passed away. <laughs> he passed away. Yeah.